<clears throat> the clever cat from the orange fairy book. Once upon a time, there was lived an old man who dwelt with his son on a small hut on the edge of the plain. He was very old and had worked very hard. And when at last he was struck down by illness, he felt that he should never rise from his bed again. So one day he bade his wife summon their son, and when he came back from his journey to the nearest town where he had been going to buy bread. Come hither, my son, he said. I know myself to be dying. And I have nothing to leave you but my falcon, my cat, and my greyhound. But if you make good use of them, you will never lack food. Be good to your mother, as you have been to me. And now, farewell. Then he turned his face to the wall and died. There was great mourning in the hut for many days, but at length the sun rose up, and calling to his greyhound, his cat, and his falcon, he left the house, saying that he would bring back something for dinner. Wandering over the plain, he noticed a troop of gazelles, and pointed to his greyhound to give chase. The dog soon brought down a fine, fat beast, and slinging it over his shoulders, the young man turned homewards. On the way, however, he passed a pond, and as he approached, a cloud of birds flew into the air. Shaking his wrist, the falcon seated on it darted into the sun and swooped down upon the quarry he had marked, which fell dead to the ground. The young man picked it up and put it in his pouch, and then went towards home again. Near the hut was a small barn in which he kept the produce of a little patch of corn, which grew so close to the garden. Here a rat ran out almost under his feet, followed by another and another, but quick as thought the cat was upon them, and not one escaped her. When all the rats were killed, the young man left the barn. When all the rats were killed, okay. He took the path leading to the door to the hut, but stopped on feeling a hand laid on his shoulder. Young man, said the ogre, for such was the stranger, you have been a good son, and you deserve a piece of luck which has befallen on you this day. Come with me to the shining lake yonder, and fear nothing. Wondering a little at what might be going to happen to him, the youth did as the ogre bade him, and when they reached the shore of the lake, the ogre turned and said to him, <laughs> Step into the water and shut your eyes. You will find yourself sinking slowly to the bottom, but take courage. All will go well. Only bring up as much silver as you can carry and we will divide it between us. So the young man bravely stepped into the lake and felt himself sinking, sinking until he reached the firm ground at last. In front of him lay four heaps of silver, and in the midst of them a curious white shining stone marked all over with strange characters, such as he had never seen before. He picked it up in order to examine it more closely, and as he held it, the spawn spoke. As long as you hold me, all the wishes will come true, he said. But hide me in your turban, and then call to the ogre when you are ready to come up. In a few minutes, the young man stood again by the shores of the lake. Well, where's the silver? asked the ogre, who awaited him. Ah, uh, my father, how can I tell you? So bewildered was I and so dazzled by the splendors of everything I saw that I stood like a statue, unable to move. 
Then hearing steps approaching, I got frightened and called to you, as you know. Uh, you're no better than the rest, cried the ogre, and turned away in a rage. When he was out of sight, the young man took the stone from his turban and looked at it. I want the finest camel that can be found, and the most splendid garments, he said. Shut your eyes, replied the stone, and he shut them, and when he opened them again, the camel that he had wished for was standing before him, while the festal robes of a desert prince hung from its shoulders. Mounting the camel, he whisked the f whistled the falcon to his wrist and followed his greyhound and his cat, and he started homeward. His mother was sewing at the door when the magnificent stranger rode up, and filled with surprise, she bowed low before him. Don't you know me, mother? he said with a laugh, and on hearing his voice, the good woman nearly fell to the ground with astonishment. How have you got the camel in those clothes? she asked. Can a son of mine have committed murder in order to possess those? Do not be afraid. They are quite honestly come by, answered the youth. I will explain all by and by. But now you must go to the palace and tell the king I wish to marry his daughter. At these words, the mother thought her son had certainly gone mad and stared blankly at him. The young man guessed what was in her heart, and replied with a smile, <laughs> Fear nothing. Promise all that he asks. It will be fulfilled somehow. So she went to the palace, where she found the king sitting in the Hall of Justice, listening to the petitions of his people. The woman waited until all had been heard, and the hall was empty, and then she went up and knelt before the throne. My son has sent me to ask for the hand of the princess, she said. The king looked at her and thought she was mad. But instead of ordering his guards to turn her out, he answered gravely. Before he can marry the princess, he must build me a palace of ice, which can be warmed with fires, and wherein the rarest singing birds can live. It shall be done, your majesty. And she got up and left the hall quickly. Her son was anxiously awaiting her outside the palace gates, dressed in the clothes that he wore every day. Well, what have I got to do? he asked impatiently, drawing his mother aside so that no one would overhear them. Oh, quite something quite impossible, and I hope you will put the princess out of your head, she replied. Well, but what is it? persisted he. <laughs> Nothing but build a palace of ice wherein fires can burn, and shall keep it warm so that the delicate singing birds can live in it. I thought it would be something much harder than that, exclaimed the young man. I'll see to it once. And leaving his mother, he went into the country and took a stone from his turban. I want a palace of ice that can be warmed with fires and filled with the rarest singing birds. Shut your eyes, then, said the stone, and he shut them. And when he opened them again, there was the palace more beautiful than anything he could have imagined. Fires throwing a soft pink glow over the ice. It's even fit for the princess, he thought to himself. As soon as the king awoke the next morning, he ran to the window, and there across the plain he beheld the palace. That young man must be a great wizard. He may be useful to me. And when the mother came again to tell him that his orders had been fulfilled, he received her with great honor, and bade her tell her son that the wedding was fixed for the following day. 
The princess was delighted with her new home, and with her husband also, and several days slipped happily away, spent in turning over all the beautiful things that the palace contained. But at length the young man grew tired of always staying inside walls, and he told his wife that the next day he must leave her for a few hours and go hunting. You will not mind, he asked, and she answered as became a good wife. Yes, of course I shall mind, but I shall spend the days planning on some dresses, and then I shall be so delighted when you come back, you know. So the husband went off to hunt, with the falcon on his wrist and the greyhound and the cat behind him, for the palace was so warm that even the cat did not mind living in it. No sooner had he gone than the ogre, who had been watching his chance for many days, knocked at the door of the palace. I've just returned from a far country, he said, and I have seen the largest and most brilliant stones in the world with me. The princess is known to love beautiful things. Perhaps she might like to buy some. Now, the princess had been wondering for many days what trimming she should put on her dresses, so that they should outshine the dresses of other ladies of the court balls. Nothing that she had thought of seemed good enough, so when the message was brought so that the ogre and his wares were below, she at once ordered that he should be brought to her chamber. Oh, what beautiful stones he laid before her. What lovely rubies and what rare pearls. No other lady would have jewels like this. Of the princess, of that, the princess was quite sure. But she cast down her eyes so that the ogre might not see how much she longed for them. I fear that they are too costly for me, she said carelessly. Besides, I have hardly need for any more jewels just now. I have no particular wish to sell them myself, said the ogre, with equal indifference. But I have a necklace of shining stones which was left to me by my father, and one, largest engraven with weird characters, is missing. I have heard that it is in your husband's possession, and if you can get me that stone, you shall have all these jewels that you choose. But you will have to pretend that you want it for yourself, and... Above all, do not mention me, for he sets great store by it, and it would never part with it to a stranger. Tomorrow I will return with some jewels yet finer than those I have with me today. So, madam, farewell. Left alone, the princess began to think of many things, but chiefly as to whether she would persuade her husband to give her the stone or not. At one moment she felt she had already bestowed so much upon her that it was a shame to ask for only objects he kept back. No, it would be mean. She could not do it. But then, those diamonds and those strings of pearls. After all, she had only been married a week, and the pleasure of giving it to her ought to be far greater than the pleasure of keeping it for himself and she was sure that it would be so. Princesses. Well, that evening, when the young man had supped off his favorite dishes, which the princess took care to have especially prepared for him, she sat down close beside him and began stroking his head. For some time she did not speak, but listened attentively to all the adventures that had befallen him that day. But I was thinking of you all the time, he said at the end, and wishing that I could bring you back something you would like. But alas, what is there that you do not possess already? How good of you not to forget me when you are in the midst of such dangers and hardships, answered she. Yes, it is true I have many beautiful things, but if you want to give me a present, and tomorrow is my birthday... There is one thing that I wish for very much. And what is that? Of course I shall f have it to you directly, he asked eagerly. 
It is that bright stone which fell out of the folds of your turban a few days ago, she answered, playing with his finger. The little stone with all those funny marks upon it. I never saw any stone like it before. The young man did not answer at first, and then said slowly, I have promised, and therefore I must perform. But will you swear to never part from it, and keep it safely with me always? More I cannot tell you, but I beg you earnestly to take heed to this. The princess was a little startled by his manner, and began to be sorry that she had ever listened to the ogre. But she did not like to draw back, and pretended to be immensely delighted at her new toy, and kissed and thanked her husband for it. <clears throat> After all, I needn't give it to the ogre, she thought as she dropped off to sleep. Unluckily, the next morning the young man went hunting again, and the ogre, who was watching, knew this, and did not come till much later than before. At the moment that he knocked at the door of the palace, the princess had tired of all her employments, and her attendants were at their wit's end on how to amuse her. When a tall negro dressed in scarlet came to announce that the ogre was below, and desired to know if the princess would like to speak to him. Bring him hither at once, cried she, springing up from her cushions, and forgetting all her resolves from the previous night. In another moment she was bending with rapture over glittering gems. Have you got it? asked the ogre in a whisper, for the princess's ladies were standing near as they dared to catch a glimpse of the beautiful jewels. Yes, here, yeah, she answered, slipping the stone from her sash and placing it among the rest. And then she raised her voice and began to talk quickly of the prices of chains and necklaces, and after some bargaining to deceive her attendants, she declared that she liked the one string of pearls better than the rest, and that the ogre might take away the other things, which were not half as valuable as he had supposed. As you please, madam, said she, bowing himself out of the palace. As soon as he had gone, curious things happened. The princess carelessly touched the wall of her room, which was wont to reflect the warmth red light of the fire on the hearth, and found her hand quite wet. She turned around, and was it her fancy, or did the fire burn more dimly than before? Hurriedly she passed into the picture gallery, where pools of water showed here and there on the floor, and a cold chill ran through her whole body. At that instant her front ladies came running down the stairs, crying, Madam, madam, what has happened? The palace is disappearing under her eyes. My husband will be home very soon, answered the princess, who, though nearly as much frightened as her ladies, felt that she must set them to a good example. Wait till then, and he will tell us what to do. So they waited, seated on the highest chairs they could find, wrapped in their warmest garments, with piles of cushions under their feet, while the poor birds flew with the numbed wings hither and thither till they were so lucky as to disappear in open window in some forgotten corner. Through this they vanished, and were seen no more. At last, when the princess and her ladies had been forced to leave the upper rooms, where the walls and floors had melted away, and to take refuge in the hall, the young man came home. He had ridden back a long, winding road from which he did not see the palace till he was close up upon it, and stood horrified at the spectacle before him. He knew in an instant that his wife must have betrayed his trust, but he could not reproach her, as she must be suffering enough already. Hurrying on, he sprang over all that was left to the palace walls, and the princess gave a cry of relief to the sight of him. Come quickly, he said, or you'll be frozen to death and a dreary little procession set out of the king's palace, the greyhound the cat bringing up the rear. At the gates he left them, though his wife besought him to allow her to enter. 
You have betrayed me and ruined me, he said sternly. I go to seek my fortune alone. And without another word, he turned and left her. With his falcon on his wrist and his greyhound and cat behind him, the young man walked a long way, inquiring of everyone he met whether they had seen the enemy, the ogre. But nobody had. Then he bade his falcon fly up to the sky, up, up, and up, and try if his sharp eyes could discover the old thief. The bird had to go so high that it did not return for some hours. But he told his master that the ogre was lying asleep in a splendid palace in the far country, on the shores of the sea. This was delightful news to the young man, who instantly brought up some meat for the falcon, bidding him to make a good meal. Tomorrow, said he, you will fly to the palace where the ogre lies, and while he is asleep you will search about for a stone which is engraved with strange signs. This you will bring to me. In three days I expect you shall be back here. Well, I must take the cat with me, answered the bird. The sun had not yet risen before the falcon soared high into the air, and the cat seated on his back, with his paws tightly clasping around the bird's neck. You had better shut your eyes or you may get giddy, said the bird, and, and the cat, who had never before been off the ground except to climb a tree, did as she was bid. All that day and all that night they flew, and in the morning they saw the ogre's palace lying beneath them. Dear me, said the cat, opening her eyes for the first time. That looks like every city rat down there. Let us go down to it. They may be able to help us. So they lighted in some bushes in the heart of the rat city. The falcon remained where he was, but the cat lay down outside the principal gates, causing terrible excitement among the rats. At length, seeing she did not move, one bolder than the rest put his head out of an upper window of the castle, and said in a trembling voice, Why have you come here? What do you want? If it is anything in our power, tell us and we will do it. If you would let me speak to you before, I would have put that at as I came as a friend, replied the cat. And I shall be greatly obliged to you if you would send four of the strongest and cunningest among you to do me a service. Oh, we shall be delighted, answered the rat, much relieved. But if you will inform me what it is you wish them to do, I shall be better able to judge who is the most fitted for the position. I thank you, said the cat. Well, what they have to do is this. Tonight they must burrow under the walls of a castle and go up to a room where the ogre lies asleep. Somewhere about him he has hidden a stone on which are engraved strange signs. When they have found it, they must take it from him without his waking and bring it to meow. Your instructions shall be obeyed, replied the rat, and he went out to give his instructions. About midnight, the cat, who was still sleeping before the gate, was awakened by some water flung at her by the head rat, who would not make up his mind to open the doors. Here's the stone you wanted, he said, when the cat started up with a loud meow. If you'll hold up your paws, I'll drop it down. And so he did. Uh, now farewell, continued the rat. You have a long way to go and we'll need to get your start before daybreak. <laughs> your counsel is good, replied the cat, smiling to itself. And putting the stone in her mouth, she went off to seek the falcon. Now... All this time, neither the cat nor the falcon had any food. The falcon soon got tired of carrying such a heavy burden. When the night arrived, he declared that he would go no further, and he would spend it on the banks of a river. 
And it is my turn to take care of the stone, he said. Because it seems that you have not done everything and I nothing. No, I got it and I will keep it, answered the cat. who was tired and cross, and they began a fine quarrel. But unluckily, in the midst of it, the cat raised her voice and the stone fell into the ear of a fish, which happened to be swimming by, though both the cat and the falcon sprang into the water afterwards. They were too late. Half drowned and more than half choked, the two faithful servants scrambled back to land again. The falcon flew to a tree and spread his wings in the sun to dry, but the cat, after giving herself a good shake, began to scratch up the sandy banks and throw the bits into the river. And what are you doing that for? asked the little fish. Do you know that you are making the water quite muddy? That doesn't matter to me, answered the cat. I am going to fill up all the rivers so that the fishes may die. That is very unkind, as we have never done any, you any harm, replied the fish. Why are you so angry at us? Because one of you has a stone of mine. A stone with strange signs upon it which dropped into the water. I will promise to get it back if you promise to get it back for me. Well, perhaps I may leave your river alone. I will certainly try, answered the fish in a great hurry, but you must have a little patience, as it may not be an easy task. And in an instant, his scales might have been seen flashing quickly along. The fish swam as fast as he could into the sea, which was not a far distance, and calling together all his relations who lived in the neighborhood, he told them of the terrible danger which threatened the dwellers of the river. None of us have got it said the fishes, shaking their heads. But in the bay yonder, there was a tunny who, though he was so old, always goes everywhere. He will be able to tell you about it, if anyone can. And so the little fish swam off to the tunny, and again related his story. Boy, I was in that river only a few hours ago, said the tunny. And as I was coming back, something fell into my ear. And it is still there, for I went to sleep. When I got home, I forgot all about it. Perhaps it may be what you want. And stretching up his tail, he whisked out the stone. I think that must be it, said the fish with joy. And taking the stone in his mouth, he carried it to the place where the cat was waiting for him. Much obliged to you, said the cat, as the fish laid the stone on the sand. And to reward you, I will let your river alone. And she mounted the falcon's back, and they flew to their master. Ah, uh, how glad he was to see them again, with his magic stone in their possession. In a moment, he wished for a palace, but this time it was green marble. And then he wished for the princess and her ladies to occupy it. And they were, they lived for many years. When the old king died, the princess's husband reigned in his stead. <laughs>